thank you all for coming. Um, so just as a show of hands, so how many of you are in charge of Thanksgiving this year? Yeah. Quite a few. How many have been in charge in the past? Okay, great. How many are terrified of being in charge? So Steve already introduced me, but just a couple things about me. Um, so uh, I grew up in Ohio in the middle of the country. Uh, and I uh, came out here to, to uh, Berkeley in about uh, 1999, and I think right about that time I came out to Berkeley was when I really started to get into cooking. I've always been a chemist, I've always loved chemical science ever since I was, was, was young, um, but uh, as a grad student, you do a lot of reactions, and I would say maybe, you know, uh, one out of five reactions actually works really well, and a lot of the others don't work, and so forth. So you get really frustrated during the week, and so what we would do on the weekends is that a little gang of friends and I would get together and we would start to cook, and we would uh, basically do recipes, do experiments. It's sort of a little bit like Cook's Illustrated, but before that was sort of all the rage. Uh, and um, I loved it. I actually loved the way that you could, you know, think a little bit about science in the kitchen and so forth. And this became both a hobby and, and now something that I uh, do lectures on uh, from time to time. Um, so first thing I usually say in these lectures is why understand any chemistry at all if you want to be a cook? Does it make you a better cook to understand a lot of chemistry? And my answer usually is not really. Okay, so not to, to spoil it, uh, but not really. I think, um, you know, there, there is certainly a lot of, of aesthetics and beauty to cooking that is, uh, flies beyond what we could describe in terms of, of just chemical terms. Um, but that said, uh, the reason I think chemistry is terrific uh, to have in a kitchen is it's more like um, if you go to an art museum, if you've taken a course in art history before you go, you have such a greater appreciation for what you're going to see. The things, uh, the, the art that's there, the, the people that made the art, what they were going through at the time. It's the same deal, that when you're in a kitchen and you can actually watch these transformations occur before your eyes, you can think about these molecules and how they're working uh, in, in, in your actual food, it actually makes it a lot more fun. There are certain damage control things you can also do with a little cooking experience, and um, today we're in particular going to talk about some of the, uh, the myths, uh, some of the science between behind uh, Thanksgiving cooking, and perhaps a little bit of damage control as well, maybe some recommendations, uh, at least some tips that I would have in, in terms of how to do some of the cooking. So I'm going to put down the front lights here, uh, just so it's a little bit easier to see the slides. So is that lighting okay? Okay, I think that'll be a little bit better. So, um, just to get started, uh, as a summary, I always show the molecules like these. Um, this is a summary of the different kinds of molecules that we eat. Uh, you know, I know that some of you might have taken organic chemistry before. Uh, many of you probably have never taken organic chemistry before. These are described as organic structures. You know, one of the main things for you to pay attention today is that in all of these molecules, whether they are carbohydrates or fats or proteins or small molecules like vitamins and so forth, in all these cases, um, what we draw in these structures are the carbons. Uh, which are the sort of vertices, the kinks in the chain right here. So every time there's a point in this chain, there's a carbon there. Um, organic chemistry being the subject of carbon, we're kind of lazy uh, folks, and so we don't like to draw them all out. So we draw these line structures like this. So when I see them like this, this should have about 18 carbons in a long chain like this. That's how you interpret these. The other key thing is mean, you get more and more into chemistry, you learn all about the different patterns of these oxygens and nitrogens that are around these molecules and what that really means in terms of, of both the biology and the behavior of the molecules. But for our purposes, what you want to pay attention to is the difference in molecules that have lots of OHs and molecules that don't. Okay, because it's a very simple distinction. When they have lots of OHs on the molecules, that makes these molecules what we call polar. Water, H2O, can interact very readily with these through hydrogen bonds, and that makes these soluble molecules. Okay, so much of cooking involves uh, controlling the solubility of molecules and changing them from place to place. If you have a molecule like this with these long chains like this that do not have any oxygens or nitrogens in them, generally we call those hydrophobic or water-fearing compounds. Those are compounds that do not mix with water, such as oils. Okay, and so um, we'll use those concepts a couple times today, but as we go through the structures, um, I uh, won't go through all the gory detail of the structures, but that's what you're looking for. Does it have lots of oxygens or reps and nitrogens in here, or is it just a green molecule that does not have them? So um, the class of molecules, so, so you of course see all different molecules on Thanksgiving in particular, but, but in pretty much every meal, but um, Thanksgiving really is a story majorly about the proteins and about the fats. Uh, we're going to focus a lot on proteins today, um, because proteins in cooking are actually the most interesting in terms of their chemistry, the way they change. They have a huge spectrum of properties, and they change when you're actually cooking your food. And so a lot of the processing that you're doing in the kitchen involves getting proteins to behave in very specific ways. So that's what we're going to focus on, because understanding that, uh, I do think, does help you a little bit uh, in terms of you know, being efficient and, and getting the results that you want. So to zoom in on proteins, so proteins, of course, being the major building blocks of meats, eggs, tofu, dairy, uh, they are also found in grains and beans. 
Um, the reason you need proteins is that you take this long string of amino acids that we have in the protein, and you pull the whole thing apart. You actually break these right next to each of these NHs right in here. You break this into the individual building blocks, like taking apart a Lego structure. And then you use these amino acids to rebuild new proteins of your own. Okay, so you have to have protein in your diet, not just from the point of view of energy, but for making the building blocks that you need to live. So um, when we talk about proteins, um, we have the amino acids as the building blocks. Amino acids um, look like this. There's a group we call an amine group. There should be a plus charge there. Uh, and we have an acid group over here, a peroxalate group. Um, that's what gives them their name, and what gives them their different identities is what hangs off of the side of these amino acids here. Okay? And so if you take a biochemistry course, you learn a lot about these. You start to learn about all the different names of these chains. The ones in here in blue, you can see this is valine if it looks like this. If it looks like this, it's leucine. And one of the things you can see is that um, these do not have any oxygens or nitrogens in the side chains. And so by what we just talked about, that makes these hydrophobic. So those types of amino acids do not like to be in parts of the proteins that are in the water. Other portions over here with these nitrogens or these OH groups do like to be in water. Those actually will be on the outside of the proteins. And as we'll get to in a little bit, this causes proteins to fold up in very elaborate ways. So the right parts are on the inside where there's no water, and the right parts are on the outside where there is plenty of water. Plenty of water. So we'll, we'll discuss that. Um, you also have the um, what we call the essential and the non-essential amino acids. You've probably seen that. They're on cereal boxes and stuff like that. Um, the uh, essential amino acids here, this means these are the amino acids you must get from your diet. You have to get these amino acids from your diet. This is in contrast to the non-essential amino acids. These are amino acids you can make yourself. Okay, so that if your diet was deficient in, say, alanine or aspartic acid, your body knows how to make that. Okay, so it's actually kind of interesting. Bacteria, for example, can make all 20 naturally occurring amino acids. Most plants can make all 20 amino acids. Humans, we're kind of pathetic, really. We can make just these four up here and these five down here. So nine of them we can make. Sometimes if we have one of these up here, we can turn it into another one. But um, by and large, we actually have very poor ability to make these different amino acids. And so that's why they're essential and why you have to watch the protein content of your food. One historical fact is that um, you have what's called the limiting amino acid. Um, methionine, this one with this sulfur in the side chain, is one that, for example, is not very prevalent in legumes, so beans and things like that. Interestingly, lysine is the amino acid that is the most limiting in grains, such as corn and so forth. And so um, this has led to a lot of historical uh, uh, combinations of foods that you see around the world, where people combine, say, lentils uh, with rice because the rice grain has the lysine, but the lentils, uh, sorry, the, the uh, lentils are deficient in the methionine, but the rice provides that. The rice is a grain, it is deficient in lysine, but the lentils provide that. Uh, another example is beans and corn in Mesoamerica, America, uh, or peanut butter and bread in the United States. So, <laughs> so these are all combinations, and you know, people have, have learned over the eons, they didn't know what the amino acids were, of course, but they've learned that these actually make you feel better in your diet. So one of the first things to talk about in terms of the proteins um, is uh, one of the common myths about uh, Thanksgiving. So um, if you eat turkey, what happens to you? You get sleepy. Yes, you are supposed to get sleepy. Why do people say that? Well, it turns out that one thing you do with these amino acids, you do make proteins, but sometimes you clip them out, especially this one here called tryptophan, and you turn them into what we call neurotransmitters. And so I've got a slide on that. Um, neurotransmitters are amino acids or they're things derived from amino acids. So this is tryptophan here. This is an amino acid in, in most proteins, actually all proteins. Um, and you, your body removes this CO2 group right here to make what we call serotonin. You also put an extra oxygen over here. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter in the brain which leads to a feeling of well-being. It leads to a sort of calming sensation. And that is why people say that on Thanksgiving you eat all this turkey. Turkey has all the tryptophan and the tryptophan makes you sleepy because of this bolus of serotonin. Okay, you all heard that before? Uh, Almost for sure that is incorrect. Uh, there are no data to support that turkey makes you any more tired than any other food. In fact, turkey is not that high in tryptophan. That's the first thing. Uh, eggs have way more tryptophan. Nobody eats an egg and says, oh. <laughs> you don't do that with a turkey sandwich. You eat turkey sandwiches for lunch all the time, probably, and you don't like to have a home after that, necessarily. So it's not that. Um, what it really is, is that um, when they, I looked this up this morning, so the American Dietary Association uh, estimates that the average American consumes 4,500 calories on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, normal is about 2,000 to 2,500, depending on your activity level. 
And so it's not that. It's because you just gave yourself up, up to 250 grams of fat. Your stomach <laughs> takes all the blood. It actually uses that to uh, help with the digestion process, and then just puts you out. Okay, so it's a little lack of, of, of blood flow and everything else than, than anything to do with the tryptophan. That said, it is important. Tryptophan does uh, serve as a precursor to serotonin. Uh, tyrosine gets turned into dopamine, which is used to uh, uh, as the, the reward uh, hormone, but it's also the neurotransmitter, but it's also used for uh, controlling neuromuscular activities. Uh, and then GABA, of course, is another one that comes from glutamate. So glutamate is one that you often find in food. Uh, monosodium glutamate, MSG, is the amino acid glutamate right here. Um, the reason that was a little special is uh, two things. So first of all, um, most of the amino acids don't really have a taste of their own. They have, um, we'll get into later, they have some specific odors and things that can be generated from them that are nice, um, but they don't really taste like very much, except that one. Um, it turns out your tongue has a specific receptor for glutamate. Okay, you have a glutamate receptor. So your tongue can taste sweet, sour, salty, bitter, but also uh, glutamate, and that's the sense that we call umami. Okay, or savoriness. Um, if you've ever tried MSG straight, it is delicious. It tastes like <laughs> exactly like chicken, kind of salty chicken, uh, as you might guess. <laughs> but anyway, um, you're, you have been programmed by evolution to like glutamate, and we'll get into why that is later. It has to do with um, foods that are high in protein have lots of glutamate in there, and so it makes sense that you actually have a taste for it. Okay? Now, um, of course, people add this to foods. You can buy it as accent here in the United States. Of course, many places around the world, uh, they add lots of MSG to food. Many people claim to have sensitivities to that. Um, and so I think you just have to try it and see if you are one of those individuals. Um, I don't know if it's an inherently good or bad molecule, uh, uh, but I think I do, you know, lots of people do report having a lot of sensitivity to MSG. Okay? Um, that said, there's a lot of MSG that occurs in your food, and again, we'll come to that later uh, from natural uh, reasons. So um, going back to the proteins, though, this is how we would look at a protein if you were a, a biochemist. And so um, what I'm drawing here is a protein with all those different amino acids that it has all folded up in a certain way. And to make this structure look a little cleaner, I'm, I'm taking some of them off. I'm just tracing the backbone. So if I just go back to my picture here, there's, we call this the backbone, this sort of central part here where all these things hang off to the sides. And um, this backbone folds up in a very specific way for almost all proteins. In other words, because some of the amino acids like to be on the inside and some like to be on the outside, they actually have a very specific pattern that they form when this folds up. Okay, so it might look like just a tangled ball of yarn or something like that, but every single one of these particular proteins folds exactly the same trace. Okay, that's what those different amino acids do. They sort of program, if you will, the protein so it knows how to fold up. Um, in biochemistry, we then often write these as these ribbon structures like this. Um, this is showing these alpha helices that represents this part down here. So this is the, you know, lots of times in magazines you'll see pictures of proteins and they look more like that. But keep in mind, this is the same thing. You're just tracing the backbone as it goes in this protein. And that trace of the backbone is, is a little bit like a fingerprint. That trace of the backbone and its identity lets you know what a specific protein is, what properties it's going to have. So this is a very important uh, protein in terms of cooking. This uh, structure is a protein called myoglobin. Um, it's called myoglobin um, because it has this uh, portion right here. This is a heme group containing what's called a globin fold. This particular way this folds up is called a globin fold. And so um, this is a, uh, a planar group right in here, and it's got an iron atom in it. Okay, and so the idea that meat contains high amounts of iron is predominantly due to this particular protein. Uh, uh, called myoglobin, which is found in um, pretty much all muscle tissue. Okay? So what does it do? Well, uh, myoglobin is an oxygen storage protein. So you're probably familiar with hemoglobin. That's the protein in your blood. It makes the blood red. It also has iron. That's what carries oxygen throughout the body. But then when that oxygen gets delivered to muscle tissue, it's stored in the myoglobin. Okay? So where this becomes important is that different kinds of meat that you uh, would cook in the kitchen has different amounts of myoglobin in it. Okay? And so that leads to some of the appearance differences that come back to the relevance of Thanksgiving. So if you've ever wondered, why is there white meat and dark meat on a turkey um, or chicken or anything like that? Um, here's an example. So um, generally speaking, on turkeys and chickens, the thighs and the legs and the back muscles are dark meat, so it's this dark color here, versus the breast meat, as it's so-called, is this lighter color here. It's even lighter in terms of chicken. Uh, the reason for that is because these muscles actually have very different functions in the animal, in the, in the, in the bird. So um, we do have turkeys here in Berkeley, which surprised me when I first moved here, but I'm sure you've all seen them. Um, and what you see is that they don't really fly. If they're in trouble, they can get out of there, they can fly a little bit, but they don't fly like very long distances. Chickens fly even less. Chickens tend not to fly at all. Um, and uh, in contrast, all day long, they sit there running around and walking around and using their leg muscles. 
And so what you tend to find is that the more a muscle is used, the longer term it's used, the more myoglobin it accumulates because it needs to store more oxygen to function. Muscles need oxygen in order to move. Um, and so when you have these long-term muscles like these, these are endurance muscles, and so they're myoglobin rich. So that's why they're bright red, because they contain more of this protein, thus they contain more iron, which gives it the red color. Okay? Um, because these birds do not fly, turkeys and chickens, so this is uh, one of my pet peeves in life. Um, there is no breast meat, they're not mammals. Okay, so turkeys and chickens don't have breast meat. Anyway, uh, these are their pectoral muscles uh, for our equivalent. Uh, because they don't flap their wings very much, again, they don't need very much in there. It's very light. So that's, that's one of the differences. Mammals tend to have all red meat. Mammals uh, uh, tend to be uh, more endurance creatures because we were running away from dinosaurs or something like that. And uh, that made us actually have more microbes throughout the tissues. Um, one uh, of my very favorite counterexamples is, of course, the duck. This is the equivalent tissue in the duck, which you can see here. There's absolutely no white meat on a duck, unfortunately. Um, uh, uh, the reason for that is because ducks actually fly for thousands of miles. They migrate for long, long distances, so they need very large amounts of myoglobin in the tissue so that they can store large amounts of oxygen. So that's why there's no white meat on ducks, but there is on birds that are generally flightless. Okay? So that's um, uh, another of the mysteries of Thanksgiving, uh, perhaps, resolved. So looking at these proteins, um, as I said, there's this folded structure, this particular folded structure they have to have in order to function right. And so all proteins have that, that personality, that fingerprint to them. Um, but that is actually one of the first things that you change when you cook something. Okay, That when you cook proteins, what you're going to do is heat them in one fashion or another. And by doing that, you're going to unravel this very careful folding that they have. And that's where all the interesting stuff happens in terms of your cooking. So just to um, do that uh, pictorially first. Um, so here we have just a cartoon. This is a very precisely folded function, functional protein. It's just, just so. It has to be always in the right places. But as we heat this, you sort of uncoil this, this uh, sort of folded up tangle into this structure here. And in fact, into all different kinds of structures. It doesn't become just one. It becomes many, many different possibilities here of just uncoiled mess. And then what tends to happen is when they're uncoiled like this, again, we've got portions of this protein, let's say these blue and green parts, that are the hydrophobic parts. They don't want to be in the water. And so what starts to happen is the proteins start to stick together. Okay, and so one protein, instead of being all by itself, will start to form long, long ropes and chains with other proteins, all tangled up. It's a big mess. Okay, these form on what can be fibers like this, and these fibers are not soluble in water. This protein might be dissolved in water, but this protein material here on the right is not. Okay, and so this leads to a lot of the things you see when foods are cooked. Um, when you do this, first of all, we lose whatever native function that protein had. So if there was some catalytic enzyme activity or something like that, it's gone by the time you cook it. Um, the second thing is that they aggregate together, and when they do that, these, uh, this decreases the solubility, and then that increases what we call light scattering. Um, so light scattering is where, um, you know, if light goes through a window, it comes right through, it's all translucent, um, but when it hits sand, sand is the same material as a window, uh, window glass, but sand has all these facets on there, and what happens is the light scatters off different surfaces, and that's why a pile of sand you can't see through it, but window glass made of the same material you can, okay? So the idea is when these proteins are all coming out, they're forming all these fibers like this, the meat loses its translucency, okay? You no longer have that, if I just go back, um, this sort of translucent character that it has like this, it actually turns um, much more opaque. Okay, so this will turn pink, this will turn actually even lighter toward white. So that's one of the reasons we see these changes that occur. Um, so uh, one of the things that you can sort of look at uh, uh, the fastest for this are eggs. Um, eggs are probably the best way to do all the protein demos, and a lot of the fat demos that you have in the kitchen. Um, uh, eggs being the, the most interesting uh, uh, container of protein that you have in the kitchen. Um, and so this is shown um, here for just cooking eggs, where if you took these eggs and you're boiling these, these are in the shell, straight from the refrigerator, dropped into boiling water, um, stopped at a pe different time periods here, and then cut in half so you can kind of see the process. Again, what we're looking at is um, the white, of course, becomes opaque. This is the opaque protein here because the proteins have all untangled. We say denatured. They're now insoluble, and now they scatter light. And so that's why the white of the, the egg goes from this clear material into this white material here. The same is happening in the yolk. It goes from this translucent yellow to this eventually solid yellow here. Okay, so you can see things getting cooked. 
Um, this also uh, helps us, um, by the way, you can all kind of time where you like your eggs. I'm a 7 minute, 25 second guy myself, but um, you all have your different results. And again, if you take the eggs out of the refrigerator and let them warm up first, that's fine, but your numbers will be off, okay, because the egg is actually warmer. So you have to take them straight from the fridge to get these results. So, so try 7 minutes, 30 seconds if you like them. Kind of goofy in the, in the middle like this. Um, okay, so this is also reminding us of something else that becomes extremely important for uh, Thanksgiving cooking, and that is that generally speaking, cooking happens from the outside in, in most circumstances. Uh, we have some medium that's going to transfer heat. Here it's boiling water. In the case of a turkey, it is typically the oven. It's the air moving around in the oven. And so what happens is that you can see it right here. The outside gets cooked while the inside temperature is still much, much lower. And so over time, you can see this now thickening on the outside as the higher temperatures are reaching the inside of the egg. All right? So eggs are about an inch uh, in diameter. And so this works pretty well that you can cook this you know, any length that you want, and you don't generally overcook the outside to get the inside done. It's not too bad to just wait around and get this nice, nice uh, consistency like this. But then you take what you learn about an egg, and you transfer that information to something that looks like this. <laughs> this I think is a Photoshop. She's not really. <laughs> <laughs> a pterodactyl, I'm not sure what. But anyway, I have blast searching for Google Images. Um, anyway, so turkeys, of course, are huge. They're actually generally the biggest thing anybody cooks, at least commonly. You know, maybe somebody roasts a, you know, an ox or something like that. But but in general, the normal cook only does uh, the turkey or smaller things. And so this causes all kinds of problems in terms of heat transfer. This is why turkey is a notoriously difficult thing to make. So if we write this as a chemist, um, we start with this uh, as a chemical equation here. We heat this for three to four and a half hours to get this. Um, but the actual results you may get are these, where um, very frequently the breast meat up here, the pectoral meat, we'll call it, um, is uh, dry and overcooked. It actually has been cooked too long uh, uh, because of the you know, excessive heating. Um, down here in the thighs and the bottom part of the turkey um, where you usually stick your thermometer, that's because that's the slowest cooking part. That's sometimes undercooked. You have to be a little careful there because you do have to keep this high enough to avoid salmonella. And then the wing tips just get crispy or burnt or all kinds of things. So I know a lot of people just cut those right straight off and throw them in their stock pot so they don't even, even bother with those. So it's actually very difficult to control the temperature all the way through the turkey. Um, so uh, this also reminds me of a, a little tip, maybe, maybe most of you know about these or not, but um, the most delicious part of the turkey, if we were going to talk about this and where it is, um, I think, and many would agree with me, are the so-called oysters. How many know where the oysters are in a turkey? A few people do, so I will show you. They're here. So if you flip the turkey over, they're right here in the back. Okay, it's an unusual place in the, in the turkey, chickens too. Um, there are these little muscles right here in the back that are delicious, succulent, juicy muscles. So here's the deal. You're all in charge of Thanksgiving. You're carving it, right? <laughs> so you carve, you cut the legs off, and the rest and so forth. Get to that bite. And when everyone goes sits down, flip the turkey over and grab these guys for yourself. Okay, <laughs> they're actually really good. Here, this is what they look like. Out. In certain places, I think, um, what's the place called? Fufu, the, the place here on Center Street. It's a Japanese place. Um, some of those places actually will sell uh, oysters like on a skewer from chickens and turkeys and things like that. So um, they're delicious. Anyway, um, back to the animal. Um, so we have this problem with the cooking. And so um, why is it that it gets dry and overcooked in the first place? And that has to do a little bit with the structure of muscle tissue and how this influences how it behaves during the cooking process. So um, just to show a diagram of this, and I should have referenced this, this comes from the book, the McGee book, that I will show you at the end. So I, I forgot to write it on the slide here, but I, I did take this from a textbook that I'll reference later. Um, that what I have here is a diagram of the muscle fibers. So you have these little fibers here. They're made of proteins called actin and myosin. That's the, basically the contractile apparatus to let your muscles contract. And they're formed in these little tubes like this with these sort of sheaths around them. And you can get really into this depending on what our topic is. There's connective tissue that goes between it here. Connective tissue, more of it makes the meat tougher but it also makes meat more flavorful. The connective tissue has a lot of collagen and a lot of fat in there. We'll talk about collagen later on. Um, but when you cook this meat, what happens is that these fibers begin to contract. As those proteins are denaturing, they become insoluble. They start to push the water out of the fibers, and the fibers start to squeeze a little bit. That's supposedly what's shown right here, and how these fibers, as they get warmer, start to squeeze, and the water starts to come out. So it's not so much that when your turkey's overcooked that you've just evaporated all the water. That's actually not it. What it is is that when you get past about 140 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit, these fibers contract, and that's when all the liquid comes out. 
Okay? And so when you cook a turkey, if you need to get it to about 165, that's where I stop because it'll continue to warm just a little bit afterwards. Um, some will say even higher you should go to. Um, but when you get to that temperature, the top actually could be 200 degrees, uh, up to 200. So um, you actually get a, a substantial amount of heat on the top, and that causes the contraction of the fibers and the loss of the liquid. You can see this in some other foods. Um, these are two examples that are very easy to do. So if you have um, uh, delicious fluffy eggs that are soft cooked, meaning you should never, in my opinion, you should never cook scrambled eggs above low. It should take you five minutes to make scrambled eggs. Okay, um, but it took me a long time to learn that because being a guy, you know, you only know to use high on the oven this time the stove. So um, I was cook them as fast as possible and get eggs that look like this. But if you cook them really, really slow and don't go past this 145 or 150 degree uh, mark, it is still safe from the point of view of killing the bacteria, but they actually don't contract and lose all the water. Okay, so that's why these eggs are, uh, contain much more water content than these eggs over same is true for steak. Um, here you see a steak that's only cooked rare. Um, if you heat that, you can actually see the actual shortening of the fibers. You can see that this is much thinner than this one over on the left. It's actually the same steak that I have. Um, and so you can actually tell that the water's been lost just by the change in the volume. Okay, so um, I like them over here, but to each their own. Um, so it is that overcooking process. So then what I thought that would be kind of neat is to look at um, thermal transfer through a turkey, because I am a scientist. I did find some interesting thing on, on the internet for this. But um, the best thing that I found, and this is not really my area, but is to approximate the turkey as a cylinder. Okay, so to say that, you know, all right, more or less our turkey will be um, a cylinder, kind of like a trash can shape. So um, they've calculated that. And so here's a mathematical model of a cylinder for heat transfer. Heat transfer an engineer, which I'm not an engineer, so if there aren't engineers, uh, please uh, be kind. Uh, but anyway, what you can see is that when we place this, place this in a heated bath on the outside, there's this cold blue spot in the middle, and it does take some substantial time for that, that to um, warm up to, let's say, this yellow temperature, which might be where you want to stop it, but the outside turns bright red. You can do this graphically. What they did here is kind of neat. They're actually looking at the core temperature going up in red, and they're looking at the surface temperature out here going up in blue. And you can see that there's a pretty big difference. I mean, this is a fictitious model. It's not really relevant to the temperatures we're cooking turkeys. Uh, but you can see this substantial difference here. And the larger the object is, meaning the bigger the volume, the bigger the difference between these two lines will be. So again, that's the turkey problem. All right? So um, this has a lot to do with how we cook turkeys uh, in order to avoid this dryness. Um, there are many tricks to avoid this dryness. We'll talk about several of those now. Um, so the first is the cooking temperatures themselves. So um, this is a general rule and a very good thing to remember when you're cooking. So it's great to have a recipe, but if you don't, suddenly have something strange you have to cook in the oven and you need to figure out what temperature or how long to cook it. A general rule of thumb is that the thicker the object is, the lower the oven temperature needs to be. Okay? The reason for that is that um, if it's really big, it's got this big volume, it takes a long time for the heat to get to the inside, you will completely overcook the outside of it. So things like roast and turkey, usually 325 to 350 for up to four hours. It's low heat for a long period of time. Okay? Um, chickens are quite different. There's a lot of variation, but the way I do it is 425 to 450, about an hour or so. That gives you nice crispy skin on your chicken. But the idea is that this is way hotter than this oven. You should never cook a turkey for a long period of time with this because the outside will be black by the time the inside is now done. But you can get away with that for the smaller birds. If you cook something even smaller, like a Cornish hen, you can go um, definitely to 450, no problem. Then you get nice crispy Cornish hens that aren't, aren't too dried out. So that has a lot to do with this. The other thing is we do something that, that makes this even worse, is we stuff the turkey. Um, so uh, the turkey roughly is a hollow cylinder, so there's no real core in the inside that, that takes a long time to cook. When you stuff a turkey, when you stuff all the breadcrumbs in there and so forth, um, that takes usually an additional hour to cook, maybe more. Okay, so it is delicious to have the stuffing that's cooked in the bird, in my view, um, but it does take a lot longer because now you just made the object even denser on the inside. Okay. The best thing if you're in a hurry is to stuff it with aluminum foil. Okay? Um, sounds gross, you don't have to eat that, of course. Um, but if you put the aluminum foil in it, the idea is that the heat actually radiates back outward again, and so you get more efficient transfer. It also uh, fills up that interior volume with something other than uh, with, with a high heat transfer material, and so it lets the heat uh, go on the inside as well as the outside. So aluminum foil is one of the things you can do, it won't hurt you. Um, uh, and then you can just take it out when you have to serve the turkey. I did that a long time ago, but usually I don't really bother. I'll get to my solution in a little bit. Um, so, uh, but anyway, stuffing on the inside is, is a little bit tricky to do. Um, this also brings up another uh, thing that I, I had this, this uh, uh, horrible curiosity about yesterday when I was uh, putting some of this together, um, which is that, well, what about a turducken? 
So, <laughs> so Trivacan, for those of you not familiar, is, is a um, fairly uh, uh, a nasty concoction of a uh, turkey, and inside that you put this deboned chicken. But inside that you have a deep, so this is in the wrong order. You put the duck inside the turkey and the chicken inside the duck. This, the turkey and the chicken are the small, so you have to debone these. If you cut one in half, they're actually not very pleasant to look at when I cut in half. But anyway, they look like this, where the outer shell is turkey, this is a duck, and this is a chicken. And then this is stuffing that you put in between. Like this, so um, weird and, 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 and gross as this sounds, this has actually been around for a long time. And in French and English cooking, these are called ballotines. And I actually found a recipe for one that had five layers, <laughs> called a pigeon and some sausage. I believe. So anyway, um, so these, uh, because they are so thick, um, the main cooking takes place all the way down around 225 for the recipes I looked up yesterday. So a long period of time. It's actually more than three hours usually, but that should uh, be Fahrenheit, right? What's that? That should be F instead of C. Oh, yeah, Fahrenheit. <laughs> okay. That's a habit. I always write cooking temperatures in Fahrenheit because that's how I think of the kitchen, but I'm, I'm still a chemist. So I always, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, thank, thank you for catching that. This should be 225 Fahrenheit um, because you want a real low temperature to get the heat transfer to go through well. Now, one thing you'll notice, and this is commonly done, is this first blast of heat at 500 degrees for 15 minutes. That's very common. Um, the reason, uh, we'll get into in a minute here, but um, the reason you're doing that is to get this nice browning on the outside because at 225, you actually can't really brown it, and we'll discuss why that is in a little while. Okay, so frequently you cook at a high heat and then you get that brown, and then you cook at a low temperature and cook it all the way through. Yeah. Matter which way around you do that? Um, does it matter which way around you? I don't know if it would or not. I always do it <laughs> this way, but I don't know why. <laughs> you may ever do it the other way? Wouldn't the thing first sort of seal the outside and keep the moisture in? Yeah, so, so there is, there's a common thing people say about searing it so that you seal the, 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 the flavor liquid in there. They've actually done experiments that I've read about for this that there's no difference in the retention of water on the inside. There, searing does do something very important, which is to brown it. And again, we'll get to that. But um, from what I've read, there's no difference if you sear it or not versus water retention um, for it. Um, so, so maybe, maybe. Yeah. I think it makes it easier if you're cooking cook it until it's at the right temperature. You don't want to do that, and then they have 15 minutes. But probably time. true, <laughs> because then you're overeating the entire thing. Yeah, good, good point. Probably just a practical practical matter. So, um, so uh, there are then, um, back to regular turkeys, um, because of these problems in cooking them and the temperatures and those kinds of things, um, there are uh, second generation turkey ideas, as I call them, which are better ways to do it. Okay? Um, I've tried some of these myself. The first one is this one. Um, this is called spatchcocking, which is not as bad as it sounds. Um, what this means is that you actually cut the backbone out. You use a pair of scissors to cut the backbone out, and you unfold the turkey like this. Okay. Um, many of you who grill might have done this chicken under a brick thing. You never better do that. Um, that's what you're doing usually. Is you do the same thing. You take the backbone out, and then you open it up. What you get by doing that is now a much flatter, much more uniform uh, uh, type of material to cook. Uh, I did this last year for Thanksgiving, and besides looking weird, I was you know, ridiculed by the family for doing it this way. It actually turned out perfectly. Um, there's a good Julie Child recipe that, that does this. You can look up online. That's the one I, I use, and they work great. And you can put a, pa a pile of stuffing underneath it, and it cooks just fine. So it will actually, um, the juices will get all over the stuffing. So I highly recommend trying this one um, to get your turkey to cook uh, much faster and more evenly. Um, the other way, of course, um, the problem with the oven is that we're using air as our heat transfer medium, and it's very inefficient. Air has a low heat capacity, and so what that means is that it's quite inefficient in delivering the heat to the food that's inside. I mean, it works. Uh, it's the most common uh, uh, type of thing we use for baking, of course, um, but it, uh, we would like to use something more efficient to cook the turkey faster. So this leads to the mighty deep fryer. Um, the deep fryer, <laughs> instead, uses oil as the transfer medium, um, which has a much higher heat capacity. So now it is much more efficient to transfer the heat from the fire underneath here uh, through the oil to the turkey. And so um, I've never actually done this, but it, it's supposed to take much less time. So have I done it? Yeah, is it faster? Yeah, it's faster. It is very dangerous. <laughs> yes, the reason it's so dangerous is you have this big bucket of oil, like gallons of oil, and usually this has a propane fire underneath. And so the problem is, um, you probably deep fried before. When you throw something deep fried, it gets all foamy. Uh, what's happening is the water is evaporating out of the food. It's making steam, which then is causing the, the frothing. If you do it with something of this size, you have to be extremely careful it doesn't like boil over. And if it boils over, the oil comes in contact with the flame below, and you get this. <laughs> <laughs> there are literally hundreds of 
pictures of turkey fryer fires on the internet. I have a blast with this. My very favorite, this is William Shatner. Uh, Google it, he does a great YouTube video on the hazards of deep frying a turkey. I think he's a special effects for his because he was actually on fire in the video. But for Star Trek fans, uh, 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 I, I definitely recommend watching that. Anyway, so do be careful because that boil over, the, you're supposed to put this in very, very slowly to prevent the boil over that would then catch fire. Okay, so it is quite a dangerous thing. Um, you know, and often beer and football's involved in chaotic. All right, so the other way is to uh, do what we call larding. Um, there's different forms of this. I, th I thought this was particularly attractive. Just cover your turkey in bacon. I, kind of do this. Uh, I, might, try, I might try this. Um, but classically, larding is done internally. I see some wide eyes over there. Uh, Classically, this is done internally, where you take um, strips of usually pork fat and then you run it through uh, to actually put it through the breast meat, so it actually melts and actually makes it more juicy. Um, that would lead to a turkey that a lot of people couldn't eat. If you're halal or kosher, you could not eat such a turkey. Um, so what you can do instead is butter and other types of things can be rubbed under the skin with much the same effect. So a lot of times recipes have that. The other thing you can do, um, it's not quite larding, but you can flip the turkey upside down and cook it for the first half, and then flip it over to brown it later, because that actually makes the juice run down into the breast meat, and when we turn it over, it's not so dry as it cooks for the last part. I've done that as well. So it's kind of hard to maneuver the giant 17-pound turkey when it's really hot, but um, you can make it work. Um, the other thing, what I actually have done, this is, this is about five years ago, um, is I just decided to, to, to try something else, and now I cook ducks. <laughs> so, the ultimate um, second generation turkey ideas is not to make one. Um, ducks and goose and geese are much more delicious, in my opinion, um, because they're much juicier and they don't have a lot of these problems. And so, um, for the last few Thanksgivings, I've actually gone this direction. But, um, you know, turkey still, still is the, the family favorite. All right, so all of these show browning on the outside. Browning is an incredibly important feature to our food. Uh, it's actually beautifully complex how the browning reactions go. Um, the good news is, I suppose, I am not able to show you specific chemical equations that show you how something browns like this. The reason is because, um, as I'll show you, a, a couple general chemical things happen, and then thousands of, and upon thousands of different things happen to make this unique set of molecules every single time. And that's one of the beauties of cooking. That means that everything that you make has a unique set of these brown, browning molecules on there that gives it the flavor and aroma that it has. Um, and that's something you can't just make in a factory in New Jersey and put on the surface. <laughs> so um, this is uh, the basic idea, though, because there is something I want to point out here. <clears throat> so you start out with sugars like this. This would be a sugar. This is a, actually glucose. It's got all these OHs on the outside of it. Um, you can write them like this, too. Sometimes we write them in a little ring like this, and sometimes we write them out uh, uh, linear like this. Um, and this is an amino acid. This is the... This should go under here, sorry. Uh, this is amino acid lysine with the nitrogen up here. Uh, and what happens is that this group here, which we call an aldehyde, will condense with this group here, which we call an amine. And when these two come together, in red I've colored an oxygen and two hydrogens. That is lost as a molecule of water. This gets spit out, and you get this new connection, where now the protein and the sugar have been bonded together. Okay? This is called an imine. And then some neat chemistry can happen. Um, what can happen is that this double bond between the nitrogen and the carbon can move over here, like that. This is what organic chemists call amatory rearrangement. We have names for all these reactions. Um, but uh, this now leads to a permanent stable linkage that puts these things together. Now, when you're heating these between 230 to 320 degrees Fahrenheit, what now happens is a whole series of reactions involving both the, the sugar part and the protein part. These things have, do all kinds of crazy um, decompositions. They fall apart, they reform, they make new rings, they spit out water, and all kinds of stuff happens. And you get molecules that look something like these. Okay, these are just three examples. There are, of course, thousands and thousands of different molecules that have been identified already that happen through this process. So again, it's different every single time. But what these molecules do um, is that they have aromas. A lot of these molecules now um, are evaporate quite readily, and so this leads to the smell. Smell is actually the most important component of taste. Um, it's much more related to your nose than it is to your tongue. Um, and so now when you experience these furans, for example, these are supposed to smell like butter caramel. These actually form quite readily when you make caramel, actually. Um, this is called a maltol. This is uh, in malt and butterscotch. Um, this is a tetrahydropyridine here. Um, this is supposed to be cracker tasting or cracker smelling. Um, that is actually made uh, synthetically, by the way. Um, all of these things uh, are created in your food in various amounts, and that gives it that unique flavor, those qualities. Okay. So up until when you surpass these molecules, you go past these temperatures, and they start to really burn and become blackened, um, this generally leads to more depth of flavor. Okay. 
Um, this is often misnamed caramelization. For example, caramelizing onions. Um, it's the same process that happens on onions. If you're a real stickler for the rules, caramelization means it's only sugar. Okay, and so that is true if you're making caramel with you know, sugar and water on the stove. But in an onion, you actually have a lot of sugar, that is true, but there's also a lot of proteins as well. So generally speaking, these caramelizations are actually called Maillard reactions. There's the word right there. These are actually called the Maillard reactions of browning. Again, um, we know all the different pieces here and there, but then radically different molecules emerge from these. And just to show that, I put out kind of, kind of a cool table from this reference here. This is just showing, um, these are the amino acids here, and when you do these reactions, if you mix these with sugar and then smell it after you heat this up, you get all these different fruit uh, uh, things here, ranging from fruity to sour to sulfury to, uh, you know, down here is prawn crackers. That's rather specific, I think. Um, <laughs> you get all these different combinations that happen just by these. And so every food is going to be a little bit different. Now to go back, um, there's, one, there's one important thing here. There's an enemy to browning reactions. Uh, there's one single enemy, and that enemy is water. Okay? You cannot brown if water is around. There's two reasons for this. First, you lose water when these molecules come together. If you're in a sea of water, then this pushes this back the other way. Okay? It tends to break these apart, and these don't form these unified molecules, these enemy molecules that we have to form. So you need to get rid of water somehow because of that. The second reason is these take place between 230 and 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, when you are in water, you can go to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, but that's as far as you can go, because then the water will boil and take all the extra heat with it. Okay, so you cannot increase the temperature. Um, even if you throw salt in, by the way, most people think it raises, you heard that? Raise the water. It does by like a hundredth of a degree. It's, it's actually not true. Um, but uh, uh, you can salt water and raise it up, but you'd have to put like cups of salt in there to actually get any appreciable increase in temperature. So water has a ceiling. So both of these mean you have to get rid of it. And so this is why um, you can brown something in a skillet and you use really high heat typically because as soon as the water is released from the food on the outside, those muscle fibers contract, the liquid comes out, you need to evaporate it immediately because if you don't, it just gets all soggy and wet and makes a bubbly mess, right? Um, the mushrooms are a great example of this. You have to heat them up pretty high in order to brown the mushrooms to get all the water out first and then it will take place. Okay? Um, that is happening actually in the deep fryer. That is its specialty because these are usually heated to about 350 degrees to 375 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, there, this bubbling you see is the immediate loss of the water and there's no water to replace it. It's gone. Okay? And so that's why browning happens so readily in these types of uh, deep fryer conditions. Okay? So that's the browning part. If nothing else, this will give your turkey or whatever you're serving a lot better depth of flavor. Um, there's another important reason for the browning, and that has to do with the other key component of the turkey, which is the gravy. Um, so this is the normal process you use to make gravy. How many made gravy before? Some kind of pan sauce gravy. Yeah, great. So this works with almost anything that you cook. Um, that when you um, remove the bird from the pan, you get all these brown bits all over the bottom here. Um, this is from all of the different uh, Maillard reactions, making all these crusty pieces of deliciousness that are all over the bottom of your pan. So now what you typically do is you add some acid to dissolve those. Um, wine works great, a little pinch of balsamic vinegar and some water works great. Something to dissolve those up that gives you a nice thick dark liquid, maybe with some chunks still in it, that's okay. Uh, then what you do is that you often uh, remove the grease from it. And so a chemist would use this thing, and actually some cooks I know use them too. I'm going to steal one from my own lab. This is called a separatory funnel. This is how we separate something like oil from something like water. Okay, we have this nice thing. We shake these up. We do this all the time. You might take an organic lab. You probably shook one of these while you do it. He does it every day up there. Um, so, uh, but then you kind of turn this little handle here and it lets the, the water part out the bottom. So um, this is the Cook's version of it right here. There are many versions of this. This is a fat separator where the fat comes to the top, the water bucket based liquid is in the bottom, and you pour it out the spout. Okay, so um, the spout has a hole down here, and you just pour this off, and that gets rid of the grease. So then you need to thicken your gravy. Um, this is another lesson. So the main ways that you thicken gravy involve starches, either cornstarch or flour usually. Um, this is the structure of a starch called amylose. This is one of the kinds that's found in, in both cornstarch and, and flour. Um, and the key thing I want to point out is it's this long, long chain. They're actually very, very long chains, much longer than I'm showing here. And these chains have all these OHs sticking off of here. Remember we talked about this earlier, those like water. The OHs like to bond with water. So when you have the starch that begins as a solid and you put it in with the water, as you heat this, that's the next step is to heat this up. As you heat this, what happens in the thickening process is that these long strands start to uncoil. 
They start to interact with all the water. They order it so the water can't flow very well anymore because it's interacting with all these ropes and strings throughout this structure, and that leads to thickening. Okay, so what you've done is you've now dissolved those long strands of starch throughout your food, and now you have this thickened sauce like this. Okay, so there are various ways to do that, and we can get into the, the subtleties of flour versus cornstarch and so forth, but basically they'll all involve the same process. Um, now, uh, once you have eaten your turkey and your gravy, um, you certainly are not done with it. At least you should not be done with it. I don't mean to be so opinionated, but I, I, I guess why I was next part. Now it's stock making time. Okay, <laughs> so how many make stock? Their own stock. Excellent. There is no faster way to improve your cooking than to make your own stock. Okay, it's very easy to do. It's kind of, I do it on Sunday afternoons. I think it's kind of calming. Um, you can do it from vegetables if you're vegetarian. You can do it with meats of any kind. You can do all kinds of stuff to make stocks. Basically, it's always the same process. You take whatever you are left over with, so they have left over. So the turkey, chicken, bones, sometimes it's, it's even veal bones, whatever you want. Um, you can do this with vegetables, as I said. Um, you add cold water, and then you um, also add a lot of vegetables, so onions, carrots. Um, I like to add fennel tops and lemongrass. Those are two of my favorites, because you're going to throw those parts away usually, and just throw them in. It makes it really, really good. Um, so anyway, these are aromatic things that are going to dissolve in the water. And then you're going to heat this just below a boil. Do not boil. We'll get into why in a second. Just keep it just below one to two bubbles per second for anywhere from four to six hours. And that is long enough usually to extract most of the flavor. You know what we're extracting that to. Um, and then you're going to get some scummy stuff on the top that you're going to have to skim off, so you remove that. And then when you're done, you just strain it and decrease it, and then you can use it in everything, including your gravy and all the other kinds of things, make soups and, and so on. Um, the straining, i got a tip for you. Uh, this is just as an aside. It's one of the best kitchen tips I know. Um, when you have this, um, there's not a whole lot of fat in here. You can often spoon it off. Sometimes you put it in a refrigerator, you can cool it down, and you can take the fat off. But one of my favorite ways to do this um, is uh, you filter it through a cloth, a cotton cloth napkin. Okay, it's going to make your napkin kind of greasy, so I get like super cheap dollar ones so that you, know, you don't have to worry about so much. Um, but if you filter through, what happens, cotton is made out of these same type of starchy carbohydrates up there on the right. So it likes water. It does not particularly like oil. And so it turns out the water of your stock will go right through the cotton napkin, but the grease won't. It actually gets stuck. It's pretty cool. Try that. Um, so the grease actually gets on the top, and you do that twice, and you got it, you got it all. Okay, so it's a much much easier way to do it than if you uh, refrigerate it, in my opinion. Anyway, you can then freeze your stock and use it for all your cooking. Um, so here's the mystery of it. So we talked about these proteins, and what you're doing is you're extracting the proteins that remain in the, 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 the turkey after the cooking is done. Gotta watch my time a little bit. Um, and so uh, what's going on? Because we talked about how when we heat these proteins up, they're actually going to solidify. They're going to form these long fibers that become insoluble like this. And in fact, that is what this scum is. That, oops, um, sorry. Uh, the scum that you have here is actually those proteins that have unfolded and they're all over the top and you kind of lift that out. You know what I'm talking about, right? That yeah. stuff. So why is it though um, that some proteins don't do this? There's one protein that breaks the rules in terms of the solubility. There is one protein you can heat up and it stays in solution. It does not form these insoluble fibers like this. You know what it is? Collagen. Collagen. So here's why. When you form these, if I just go back, these form these you know, long, ropey fibers like this. What's happening is that individual proteins are coming together, and they bring together these NHs with these oxygens. These are from the peptide backbone, the protein backbones themselves. And they line up like this. So this hydrogen forms a bond with this oxygen, the hydrogen with the oxygen. It does this over and over. We call these sheets, beta sheets, really. Uh, these are sheets that form, and they happen all throughout the protein and with different proteins. So that's really what's holding a lot of this together. Okay. So interestingly, if we had a protein that didn't have these NHs here, it would not be able to do that, right? Because it won't be able to form these interactions. It wouldn't be able to make these sheets. And that's actually the structure of collagen. Collagen looks like this. It's kind of funky, but it's got this group here in red, followed by this, these two rings. So this is glycine, proline, hydroxy, proline, we would say. The point is, my NH, I have one here, but I do not have a hydrogen here. And I do not have a hydrogen here either. I'm missing them. Okay, so high collagen doesn't have those NHs, just a few, and so it does it frustrates it. It's actually not able to make these really well-defined sheets like this. And so when you heat collagen up, it dissolves, and it actually behaves much more like a starch. Because now, the well, water kind of interacts with it, and it gets ordered around all these ropes of, of collagen, but they actually stay in solution. Okay, so that's why 
Gelatin is the other way to thicken something. So you can do that with starch of some kind. You can also do it with protein gelatin, which is largely collagen. This is an electron micrograph of that. You can see here, um, these are these ropes of collagen that are found in here. This is, um, you can kind of see how they're all tangled up, but they're all in solution. They're not one of these insoluble fibers. So of course this leads to many foods. Um, this, uh, you can buy gelatin, you can sometimes spell it with an E, sometimes not. Um, I don't, but a lot of times the products do. Um, you can make uh, nice stocks. The sort of mouth feel of a good stock or consomme is from the, the, uh, um, uh, the collagen inside. It makes it kind of that thick, makes your lips, lips sticky after you have it, right? That's the protein in there that's doing that. Um, if you cool it down, you may have found this in your own stock, that it actually will solidify at room temperature often because there's so much collagen. So you can make things like aspics, which are not so popular here in the United States, but um, are, are used in a lot of cooking. Or you can go to town and make all kinds of artificial things, like jello bowls, where I'm from. Uh, in Ohio, in our jello, I don't know why. Um, gummy bears and, of course, marshmallows are also made of collagen. Um, collagen is not a vegetarian. Um, it comes mostly from a hides of animals, actually, how it comes commercially. So those of you who are vegetarian uh, uh, would not be able to eat, in general, things made of collagen. So these are kind of sneaky gummy bears and marshmallows here, because you don't really realize that it's in there. Um, the other thing is, it's not necessarily kosher. So if you do keep kosher, um, you have to buy specialized gelatin that's actually made from, from cows, but not from pigs, for example. Okay, so there are, are some things to watch out for that. Okay. Um, so uh, we're kind of out of the time. We're at the end. I had one more thing I was going to show. How's everybody doing? Do you have a few minutes? Okay. Okay. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I was going to talk about one more aspect of Thanksgiving, which is also important, involves protein science, and that's uh, baking. Okay. We'll talk about baking a little bit. So um, of course, the other side is making all your dinner rolls and things like that. And so baking, um, baking involves principally uh, grain, usually flour. Um, flour is a very interesting mixture. It's part starch, that is true, we're just using that in our gravy thickening, but it's also part protein. And um, there's proteins in there that are collectively called glutens, which you, I'm sure all heard of, they're all over the popular press right now. Um, gluten is a generic term, there's actually two sub-proteins within it. They're called gliadin and glutenin in there. And they actually have slightly different properties. So those proteins um, are important for giving um, bread the sort of structure that it has, because what we talked about, we have this folded structure, and if we heat it, we can unravel this protein, and they start to stick together. You can also do that mechanically, okay? It's like this. So you have these proteins all folded up appropriately, and then when they're in bread and you knead the bread, what's happening is that they're rubbing against each other like this. And when they do that, the friction actually starts the proteins to unravel, and they start to connect and form these fibers once again. So even if you're not heating it, if you use mechanical force, you can actually make larger and larger and larger collections of protein ropes. So that's what happens when you knead bread. When you knead bread, it's the mechanical shear force that causes specifically the glutenin strands to agglomerate. People say you're building the gluten in your dough. You're actually building the glutenin in your dough. So that's the specific protein strain, but close enough. Okay? Um, these long ropes then lead to the elasticity that you have. Um, the most common thing you do is you add yeast or another leavening agent in there, and that produces small bubbles of carbon dioxide as any sugar that's found in there. And these are trapped within this network of these fibers, these ropes, and that's what makes it rise. Okay? And then when you put it in the oven, those little pockets of gas expand very quickly, and that's why things rise a little bit more in the oven and retain their shape. Okay? So that's the basic process of, of bread making. Um, Many people are intolerant to gluten. Many people avoid eating gluten. Usually, in the severe cases, it's actually its pair, gliadin. Uh, gliadin is actually the one that causes um, a, a severe inflammatory response. Um, celiac sprue is the disease associated with this, or the, the condition associated with this that, that many people have. So when people have a gluten sensitivity, that my understanding is it is usually to the gliadin that's present. Um, the two are kind of inseparable, so you can't really have one without the other one. And of course now there are, are lots and lots of gluten-free products that use alternatives to these proteins that try to achieve similar results. So we'll just focus on these. So this, what's important to understand is that there's sometimes when you want to build up this network and sometimes when you don't. I'll give you an example. Imagine going to a friend's wedding. Okay, and you go and you have the wedding cake, and it's a nice day. You get to cut the wedding cake and so forth, and they bring out a bread knife and saw off the thing like it's a bagel, right? And clearly that's not the right texture. It's not what you want in terms of wedding cake. You want something that your fork just goes through, right? It has flour too. So how do you get something that is tender and flaky, like a pie crust or a cake, versus something that is hard and chewy, like bread, pretzels, bagels, and pizza? Okay? And it all has to do with how much you build this glutenin network within the food. 
Um, this leads to some of the rules and some of the vagaries in how you cook different things, specifically for our purposes today, pie crust. Okay, pie crust, because you do not generally want a chewy pie crust that is generally deep as bad. Okay, um, so how do you control this and get the results that you want? Um, well, one of them is that you do not overwork the dough. Generally speaking, you do not need pie crust. You just get it mixed together and you leave it alone. Same is true for biscuits, because you, the last thing you want to do is build up all that gluten network. Okay. The next thing is, you add fat, because if I said it's friction between the proteins that makes them come apart, well, if you lubricate the individual proteins, like putting oil on them, it doesn't happen. Okay, and so that's why there's a lot of fat built, a huge amount of fat built into pie crust, because that, again, keeps these glutens from, from forming these networks of glutenins. Um, and then finally, um, one way that you can prevent this is adding sharp pieces to it. But I don't mean, I don't mean like filings or anything. Um, but like whole wheat flour has little pieces of the kernels in there, I'm told. Um, and so what happens as you need that is that they sever these strands. They're like little tiny knives. Very thin with more energy, but they're little tiny things. On uh, the microscopic scale, they sever the strands. And so that's why um, whole wheat pasta actually has a crappy texture. Okay, because, <laughs> my, uh, because you can't build up the gluten because um, first you have these components. Also, there's more fat in whole food. Uh, 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 whole, whole wheat pasta because it's still got the, uh, the, the, uh, the whole grain uh, in there. This is just the starch and the protein level. Um, so anyway, these are the rules and that's why pie crust. You keep everything absolutely cold, you do everything in a minimal amount, and you don't overwork it or else you'll get a, you won't get a tender pie crust. Also, the same is true for biscuits. There's one other important ingredient and that is butter, which is the last one I'll talk about. Everybody's favorite. Um, what is butter? Why is it so special? Um, many reasons. Um, from the flavor component, it's diacetyl and acetylene. These are the two compounds that smell like butter. Okay, so um, this has been noted by the movie popcorn industry. And so they actually were sued not too long ago because uh, all this, I think it was Orville Redmark or one of those. Um, uh, this diacetyl was being added, which is um, a cancer suspect agent, as it turns out. The amount of butter is probably fine, but when you have large amounts of it to make it smell artificially butter-like, that was maybe the concern there. I don't, I don't know. Um, so that is actually added, but it occurs naturally. But the most important part for our purposes is the fact that it's got this water in it. Butter is a solid. It's a solid fat at room temperature, uh, and up to 20% of it is water, kind of counterintuitively. Because it's a solid, what that means is that you have little tiny droplets of water. It's not mixed together, because oil and water don't mix still. Um, but what happens is little droplets of water are trapped in the fat. And because it's a solid, they're stuck there. Okay? You can see this if you've ever clarified butter. That's what's going on here. If you just microwave it or heat it, you'll see it divided into three components. This is the fat, uh, plus the diacetyl, plus some of the other you know, flavonoids and stuff. Um, down here, this is the water that comes in the bottom. This is the water portion that's now... Um, because it's melted, it's no longer held in place and it drops out. And this frothy stuff at the top are the proteins that are in there that have now been denatured, okay, forming the scum on the top. So if you want uh, clarified butter, you just you know, remove this from the top, pour this very carefully, and leave the water down here, and you have clarified butter. It's very easy to do in the microwave. Um, but you don't want to do that for your cooking. The last thing you want to do when you make a pie crust or a biscuit is to melt your butter. And the reason is that these water components are very important in giving rise when you're baking something. And so I can show this with this example. This is making biscuits, but not pie crust. But the idea is that we have this butter, we distribute it throughout the flour, we knead this out. Um, you often put more butter and fold it if you're making a puff pastry or whatever. But the point is, when these get cooked, um, as long as your butter remained a solid the whole time, as long as it was cold, those water droplets are trapped in all these little pieces. And then in the oven, they make steam and they puff up. Okay. Um, popovers are sort of the ultimate demonstration of this. Um, so you get this rise and lift, which makes things flaky and have layers and so forth. And so the ultimate of that, of course, is the croissant. Um, this is where you even enhance it more by buttering this and then fold it. And you butter it again and fold it. There's a lot of butter that goes in there. And again, if you've ever made these, you keep them really cold. Okay, So that, that worked great where I grew up because it's very cold outside. It doesn't work so well here. So you often put it in the refrigerator in between working your, your dough. Right? So that's why you keep everything um, absolutely cold. Okay. All right, so um, we're out of time now. What I want to do is, is allow some uh, time for questions at the end. I was going to talk a little bit about making desserts, but we'll have to save that for another day. All right, I'll talk about one thing. All right. <laughs> Water and oil do mix occasionally. Uh, uh, when specific, you know, they're just left on their own, they don't mix um, under normal circumstances. But there's one way you can do it, and that's add um, a detergent, like soap. This is what you do when you wash things. In your house, you often use various kinds of detergents that have an end that likes water and a tail that does not like water. Okay, and then the idea when you're doing laundry is that it takes a greasy particle, all the tails go around it, it helps to dissolve it, but the part that likes water is surrounding it, so that allows you to wash off your clothes or whatever. Same for washing your hands. 
Um, well, you don't normally put soap in your food, but there is one, and that's called lecithin right here. Um, this is nature's detergent. This is a component of the cell membrane. It's a, phospho, uh, a phospholipid. Um, this is found in, in, in any kind of cell, um, most human cells. Um, and this lecithin can be added, um, it looks like this if you draw it all together, where you have all these blue tails, that's this part here which does not like water, that's all in the center, and on the outside, this part here with the charges and the nitrogens and the phosphorus, that's all this outer portion shown in red, and so this can now suspend in water. And then what you can do is if you add fat to this, that fat can be contained within this micelle, so it will drop it on the inside, okay? So um, you've done this most likely, I think it's even on the slide, but um, if anyone's ever made mayonnaise before, if you haven't, you should try it. It's, it's really easy to do, it's delicious. You'll never buy the stuff in a jar again. Um, that is an emulsion of usually a small amount of water, usually some lemon juice in it. Uh, it's an emulsion of that in oil. Okay, and what holds it together is a lecithin. In this case, the lecithin comes from egg yolks, which is a natural source of lecithin. They're very high in lecithin content. Um, another one is uh, uh, hollandaise. This is the same idea, but using butter as the fat instead of using oil. Uh, and then many salad dressings also contain these. Um, another source, if you don't want to use raw eggs for salad dressing, is mustard seed. Mustard seed is also oddly high in lecithin. So if you ever, ever add mustard to a vinaigrette, right, you be, and then you can whisk it together and it kind of stays together. right? So that's the lecithin, the detergents found in the mustard. So um, there's one food in particular that might be a little unsuspected that takes advantage of that, and that is um, the one that I'll end on for real, which is chocolate. Okay, so chocolate is a very interesting substance from many uh, points of view. Um, it is fat. Chocolate is um, very high in fat content. Uh, uh, the cocoa butter, it's called, is, is the fat portion of this. Um, but within it are tiny little droplets, or crystallites rather, um, of different flavor components, the things that make chocolate taste good and smell good and so forth, and, and um, also a lot of the color. Um, these are tiny little crystallites, and this is an electron micrograph of the Trader Joe's chocolate bar I found online. Um, and so what you see is, um, it's actually very complicated how you get this crystal form to appear. So if anybody's a chocolatier, you often do this really weird thing where you heat it up and pull it down, heat up, anybody do that before? called tempering chocolate. Yeah, it's because there's actually six different types of crystals that chocolate can make, and you only want one of them to get the right texture for the chocolate bar. So people have figured out over the centuries just the right way to eat it and cool it different ways. So pretty fascinating, actually. But um, what holds this together, um, again, and you have just a blob of cocoa butter, but what holds it together with all the flavor components, again, which are dissolved in the water, at least initially, are these detergents. There's actually a lot of natural lecithins that are found in chocolate, and that makes the whole emulsion work. So if you ever looked at an old chocolate bar and seen this, what that is is sometimes called a bloom. Um, it's actually harmless. Uh, it doesn't hurt you at all. It might mean it's been sitting around for a while, but that's not that bad. Um, what this is is where there's been some evaporation on the outside, and the fat is actually separated out. So the white stuff is actually the pure cocoa fat on the outside of this um, called a bloom. Um, to prevent this, what a lot of manufacturers do is they add in more less of it, which keeps it like this even if it's been heated. Um, again, probably harmless. The lesson comes from either eggs or some other natural source like that. Um, but that's sort of one of the things they add. It's an emulsifier, they call it, which keeps this whole thing together. So they all over the place. Um, finally, you've probably heard all kinds of things about chocolate being good for you. Um, this is the press that everybody tends to like to read and so forth. Um, there's a number of reasons. Um, just in short, um, there's a lot of compounds we call antioxidants, like lipoic acid and other things in chocolate. These are molecules that protect you from the oxidation that occurs um, as we age. Now, is it proven that if you eat chocolate, you'll live longer and age less? No. Okay. I think it's one of these things where um, the molecules in it are supposed to have that property, and so we assume that's the best way to get them in your diet. So um, anyway, so a lot of these are found in chocolate. A lot of these are natural antioxidants, which um, make it actually now a health food of sorts. So anyway, chocolate being one of the, the main components of uh, you know desserts and things like that, I thought I would. Um, I do want to show you where you can get more information, though. Um, so uh, this is a sort of a series of references here. Uh, if you want to catch these, you might even take a picture with your cell phone or something like that. Um, a lot of what I talked about, probably the best place to go to find out information about cooking science is this book called uh, On Food and Cooking by Harold McGee. Um, it's kind of the official resource on the topic. Um, it's kind of encyclopedic in its size. Um, it is rather detailed, and so it's not a quick read. Okay, so um, that's where you would look something up. But pretty much everything is in there. And that is where I got those pictures of the meat fibers. Um, what I really like is this one. I recommend this to people all the time. It's called What Einstein Told His Cook. Um, it's by this guy, Robert Wolka. Um, he's at uh, NYU. He's a physical chemist. And basically, he collected a column. He had a column for years where people write in their questions about food science, and he would answer them. And he's a really good writer. He's actually pretty funny, and a lot of the things are, are amusing. That's where it talks about um, 
they actually do the calculation about does the salt make your pasta water temperature go up? No. Things like that. Um, so it's a great book. It's a really good read, and there's even a sequel to it. Um, Cook's Illustrated or America's Test Kitchen, they're kind of related. Um, those are some of the best. They read like scientific journals of a sort where they have experiments and they tell you what went wrong, what went right. Um, so that's also a great way to learn some kitchen science. Um, and then um, this, the internet is just completely filled with this stuff these days. There's all kinds of programs. But I like this Serious Heats blog. Um, it's by J. Kenji Lopez Alt, is this guy here. Partly because he's extremely obsessive. There was an article on cookies <laughs> where he made, I forget, he made like 300 batches of cookies to test exactly the different ratios of the sugars to get the melt right and so forth. I admire that. <laughs> uh, here, this is a, I believe this is an anchovy tasting where they're tasting all these different anchovies. So um, it's a great, if you're obsessed about food but want to learn some science behind it, that's a great place to go to. So, so finally, um, what I'll do is open up for questions. I'll just say to everybody though, enjoy your holiday and think about science. Um, not specifically, but yeah, brining, um, it all comes down to the salt. Uh, the, the, there's a couple ways. I mean, the, the, I think one of the explanations behind that is that as you have more salt in the tissue, um, it tends to retain the water just a little bit better it's because you don't want to dehydrate it out of there. I don't know um, if there's actual, I'm sure there's science behind it, like if they waited before and after, that kind of thing. But it definitely is true that it increases the sodium content, and pretty much all food tastes better with salt in it. Okay. There's, there's so a really good serious eats piece where they do weigh all the meat before and after. <laughs> and what did they find? Uh, it actually ended up lighter, I believe, but it seemed to improve the cooking process. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. All of these things are like this. Why do you think it works? And, and it does. It is, I've done it myself. It is, it is good. What I don't like about brining a turkey is you've got this big vat of salmonella water over yeah. there. You have to watch out for that. But that aside, I mean, it's, it's, it is a great way to increase the taste. So probably it's largely the salt. All the, also, these things you inject, like the syringes you inject in your turkey and stuff like that, that's also most of the salt. Yeah. Just an anecdote from long ago. Uh -huh. uh, I was hosting uh, Thanksgiving in Buenos Aires, uh -huh. and so introducing my Argentinian friends to the turkey dinner. Um, we had a wonderful dinner. It was hard to find a turkey dinner, but we had one, and in that big country. And so when I went out to get the dessert, I came back to the table, and all our friends from Buenos Aires were like this. <laughs> huh. so, so, did you put something in the turkey? <laughs> <laughs> Cocktails beforehand? <laughs> yeah. Never seen that before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, the ingredient, the myoglobin probably did not be great, and so that's why it is not so hot. Um, so, it, it, it uh, the toughness is a little bit different, um, but so the myoglobin probably is the very center where it's the red, it's probably is still folded properly. So I don't remember the exact temperature for myoglobin, it's like 120 or something. So it's, it's probably still okay at the very center. And then as you go out, it's going to be more and more gray when it's beneath. The, when the iron falls out of the myoglobin, it turns brown. That's, that's what happens there. So, um, but the toughness is kind of a different thing. So you can kind of go two ways with the toughness. You can have um, steaks that actually have a fair amount of connective tissue, but you don't overcook. Um, that keeps these fibers from contracting and losing their water. So something like a ribeye is something you tend not to overcook. If you overcook a ribeye, they get really tough. Okay. Um, so what you do is you undercook it so the fibers don't lose the water and it's a little bit more tender. And that lends a lot of flavor. That connective tissue where all the collagen is uh, is, is really very flavorful. The other way you go uh, is to uh, completely cook it for a long period of time. That's more like ribs or something like that, which have lots and lots of connective tissue. You never eat rare ribs. I've never heard of such a thing. They're really tough, but over a long, long period of time, the proteins break down and break down and break down at the high heat, and that's what makes them more tender. So you can kind of go to the two extremes. It's the middle ground. Yeah. Just a follow-up. Now, it is very popular to cook meat in a water bath. Oh, sous vide. Oh, yeah, sous vide. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, does that mean that it doesn't really degrade to that degree, and yet it's fully cooked? Yes, yeah, so, so the point of sous vide cooking is you cook in a, in a temperature controlled bath, in a, usually with no air around it, that's the, the, the um, vacuum part. And um, the idea is you cook the whole thing through to the perfect temperature. I don't think you could, 
I don't know how long it takes a sushi to turkey, that's fascinating. But, um, but like a steak or something or salmon, you can cook all the way through to like 140 perfectly or 135. And then um, the thing is, it's not hot enough to brown it. And so you almost always then take it out, and if it's a steak, you just sear it at very high heat, which then um, does the Maillard reactions on the outside to get the flavor, but doesn't actually have time to cook the inside. Yeah, so that, that's usually what's going on there. And you do have to still have to with anything, you have to watch to make sure it goes about around 135, 140 degrees is where you need to cook it. Uh, up here first, you're right. Uh, very quickly about the brining. The Cook's Illustrated people did a book, and they mentioned brining it is not just a matter of the salt. Yeah. They, they mentioned something about denaturing the proteins, mm -hmm. but I read it many years ago. Um, and as far as people say about which uh, order, in terms of the high heat versus low heat, a lot of times people like this side worked in the restaurant, and we do like the, the other one, sear it on the side, we use a little part cheese. So oh, yeah, the other one. This is curious, you know, if there are chemical changes that are taking place. You know, the, the way that those proteins are, are yeah. interacting so, in such a complicated way that maybe, you know, the order actually might. Yeah. Never really. Very, very well. okay. You can figure that out with some science, but I, I don't, I don't, I've never seen how they do it. It's an interesting experiment. But yeah, certainly, yeah, she brought up a lot of people use the blowtorch. There's a Tom Keller recipe, it's a blowtorch. I'm not very much make some time. You know, um, if he does it, it's got to be good. <laughs> You're next. Couple questions. Is it aluminum bad for you? Why does lemon juice help you clean? Okay, so aluminum, um, there's, it's a complicated story about aluminum. So what was thought for a while was that aluminum concentrations in the brain might be linked to Alzheimer's disease. Um, that, so far as I'm aware, there's no scientific evidence for that. So, you know, it's, it's hard to tell these things, but I think that's been debunked is my understanding. Um, is aluminum bad for you? It's always a question of where it is, right? If it's in the brain, possibly, but if it's something you're not eating it, it doesn't dissolve appreciably in any of this stuff. And so having aluminum foil or aluminum soda cans or things like that, so far as I've ever read, is okay. Yeah, um, you know, always have suspicion about everything, right? But I think I think it's probably okay. Lemon juice, probably mostly um, two things. One is that there is acid in there. Uh, uh, you have the the acid lemon juice, which helps you to generally clean things and make proteins sometimes more soluble when there's a little bit of acid there. The other thing in lemon juice is um, a lot of things that we call chelators, so like ascorbate, um, things like that, vitamin C. Those types of things can grab metals and kind of bind them a little bit. So if you have some you know, uh, metals involved in what your stain is, it can actually help with that as well. Sort of a natural form of it. Uh, I don't, next, yeah. What is there about a microwave that interacts with proteins in such a way to make every food you put in the microwave suck? <laughs> so, okay. The way a microwave works is short. Is uh, it's actually pretty interesting. That uh, that uh, Einstein book has tons of stories about microwaves. So because um, there's no cooking appliance more mysterious than the microwave. But what happens? The microwaves are actually harmless. Um, it's called radiation, but radiation is just a generic term. It's not anything like ionizing radiation as you worry about. Um, it's, it just produces the microwaves, and they actually interact with water molecules in your food in particular. And when they react with water molecules, they make them start to turn. They make them start to spin really fast. And they collide with other molecules due to friction, and that friction starts to heat up the food. So what's happening in the microwave is you're specifically, usually it's the water molecules that you're heating up very quickly. Now, it can directly interact with proteins and make them start to jiggle around more. There are other things that can happen, and of course, metals go to town. And so grapes are also a I don't know why they do it, but try that sometime. <laughs> um, or, or just Google it. But yeah, so, so but why does microwave food suck? Um, one of the main reasons for that is that you cannot achieve the high temperatures on the outside to sear. Um, so a lot of what you're used to for uh, stovetop cooking in a skillet, you can't brown. Right? That's the tricky part. So they do make new microwaves now, which have these broiler things in the top. So you can apparently microwave it and then use the broiler. I actually have one of those. I've only used the broiler once, and, and every other time I just take it out and put it in the skillet and brown it like I'm, you know, like I'm supposed to. So, so I'm actually, I, I agree with you. I don't tend to like food cooked in the microwave. Like, I'm fine to rewarm it or something like that, but if I'm going to cook something, I, I'm almost never use it. If you want to steam vegetables, it's okay. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts are about um, the prospects for achieving delicious artificial meat. Because you mentioned like yep. connective tissue makes the meat really tasty, and I've heard that that's one of the reasons that's very difficult to make. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm not up on the story. There are uh, companies, approaches, people around that are trying to do this from a cell culture, basically, which would make it a non-animal source of meat. So um, I, I don't know what the secrets are to do it. Uh, it does make sense what you say, because if you're growing it, you could get the proteins, they would be the same ones, but getting that structure of all those fibers with the right parts in it, that, that would be very hard. Very hard. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
That's basically all I know about. Questions? Yes? Um, can you say a little bit more about MSG and how that, and why is that so effective? It's because your, your tongue has a uh, taste bud for it specifically. It actually responds to two things. Um, one is MSG, and the other is called inosine. And inosine is actually a decomposition product of uh, DNA and RNA. Okay, so what happens, the, the argument for why we have this is that, um, you know, that sort of gave us a taste for eating high-protein content food. Okay, so over the eons. So then that made us, you know, grow bigger brains or something like that. Um, so, the, one of the things about cooking I think I forgot to mention, and one of the things that makes it taste good, is you are breaking apart the proteins when you cook, especially when you brown. And that browning is making glutamate and inosine on the surface of the food. So, part of that brown color is also um, MSG, okay, which, which uh, hits that taste receptor. That's why it tastes so much more savory and interesting. Okay? So, again, there's a difference between the amount of MSG that's natural in your food that you're getting, you know, and so forth. Versus, you know, a very lot like grams of it that you're supplementing in your diet. There probably is, you know, there's a big spectrum there, right? And so again, many people report sensitivity to it. And I don't know what if there's any if they understand the, the, the physiology of why that would be. Yeah. Just a comment. For the last few years, I've been uh, cooking my turkey in a in a device called uh, oilless turkey fryer, and it uses uh, infrared. And it takes a yeah. much shorter time. Yeah. And it browns the turkey real nice and yeah. crispy skin and a short time. So that's a great tip. So so there yeah, um, so in the oven what I said was that you have the con it's a convection of the air and so when you have a convec it's always convection in the oven, when you have a convection oven, they have a fan that blows it around, that's all it is. Um, but regular ovens are also using the convection mechanism. But the other way is infrared transfer, so that being radiation transfer, like a toaster works. And um, yeah, so that, that makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of pizza cookers that work that way too, they're supposed to be pretty good. I've heard about. So great tip. Are they at home?